longest journey starts with the first step. So you don't have to, you don't have to do this all tomorrow. If you, hey, here's the thing. Why don't you just start with listening? You know, I, I talk to a lot of managers that take a new job and they go, you know, what, what, what advice do you have for someone starting a new job as a, as a, as a manager? I say, well, well, my advice is um, just take a step in that direction. Try listening more than talking. Welcome to another episode of People Hum interview series. I'm your host, Neha Murthy. And let's begin with a quick introduction of People Hum. People Hum is an end-to-end, one-view integrated human capital management automation platform, the winner of the 2019 Global Cody Award for HCM that is specifically built for crafted employee experiences and the future of work. We run the People Hum blog and video channel, which receives upwards of 200,000 visitors a year and publishes around two interviews with well-known names globally every month. And now for our guest. Dr. Bob Nelson is the world's leading authority on employee recognition, motivation, and engagement. He is the president of Nelson Motivation Inc., a management training and consulting company specializing in helping organizations improve management practices, programs, and systems. He has consulted with 80% of the Fortune 500 and presented on six continents. He is an executive coach and strategist for HR issues. Welcome, Bob. We're thrilled to have you. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. It's a pleasure. So the first question I had for you, Bob, is can you tell us a little bit about your journey so far and what has brought you to Bob Nelson Consulting? Yes, absolutely. Well, you know, John Lennon, the musician, once said, life is what happens to you when you're making other plans. And um, kind of uh, most of our careers tend to be one thing leads to another thing leads to another thing and with me um, early uh, since I was very young I was always curious about the topic of motivation why do people do what they do and and what impacts that and uh, psychology was my favorite topic in in studies and I got um, that was my major and then I got a MBA in organizational behavior from Berkeley. And then I, I got a um, PhD uh, in, in human behavior <laughs> at, with um, Peter F. Drucker Graduate School of Management. And so I, I was able to study on this topic uh, to greater and greater depths. And uh, along the way, worked with some great leaders. Um, Ken Blanchard, uh, who wrote The One Minute Manager, just sold 14 million copies. It was was um, I worked for him with him for for over 10 years, and um, currently I'm a personal coach for Marshall Goldsmith, who's ranked as the number one executive coach in the world. So I've I've been blessed with a uh, great opportunity. I've, I've worked hard, but I I've, I've also uh, we're all a function of who who we learn from. Uh, in in my PhD, I, I looked at this, the topic of, of motivation and we, we have overwhelming proof that you get what you reward. What, that, uh, what, when, you, when you thank someone, uh, what you inspect, what you incentivize, what you get more of. We probably have 400 studies that say that that's a fundamental truth when it comes to human nature. And it also is the biggest driver of performance known to mankind. So a pretty important topic. And what, what I, I'd worked for several corporations and I was, I was a, a little bit surprised or confused why, with that being so important, why don't more companies do this? Why don't more managers systematically use recognition? And uh, that was what I focused on for my dissertation topic. I, I looked at I, a very simple question. I think the best research that starts with very simple questions. Why is it some managers thank and recognize and reinforce their employees and other managers don't? There you go. And I did a three year study just on that question. Um, a year of it was just setting up the study. I looked at uh, 47 national 
and international organizations. And each one I found managers that were exceptional at recognition, at thanking people, at uh, encouraging them, and in the same organization managers that did not do it. Uh, by their own admission and by their direct reports and the organization sponsor, a, th a three-way validation. They had people in this camp or in this camp in the same organization. So a lot of variables were held constant. That is, that they affected them both the same. The size of the organization, uh, educational background, et cetera. So it, it allows you to focus in on the one dimension you're, you're most trying to study. And, I, and after I set that up, I, I, I considered 167 variables to see which had the greatest impact on this topic of employee recognition. And 99 of them had some significance, had some impact on dividing these two groups. And um, what, what I found to summarize three years of work in a sentence or two is that uh, for those managers that didn't use recognition, they, um, on top of the list is they, they, didn't, they didn't know how to do it well. They didn't really understand the topic followed by they didn't think it was as powerful as I'm telling you right now. They didn't think it was that important. And, and they certainly were busy, so they didn't have time to do that. And, and uh, maybe someone else should be doing that, like, like HR or, or the CEO. It's not my job to motivate people, so, you know? And uh, no one did it for them. Um, so when someone starts doing it for me, maybe I'll consider thanking other people. And, and they were afraid of leaving people out. And the list kind of went on and on. And, and uh, those are the, 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 big, the, the big reasons why they didn't do it. And they all seemed justifiable, but from my perspective, they all kind of seemed like excuses, you know, uh, that if we, we don't do those things that, the be when you look at people's behavior, for any of us, our behavior stems from and follows our beliefs. And if we don't believe it's important, we're not going to do it. If you don't believe exercising is important or eating right is important, then you're not going to care about it. You're going to never exercise. You're going to eat whatever you want and, you know, you don't care. And, and so if you want to change someone's behavior, you have to start inside them, inside their head with their beliefs. Uh, their head, their hands, their heart. The, the head is what they believe. Their, their hands is, is how you actually do it in the heart. Is, is what they feel about it. And so that's why managers didn't do it, uh, which was interesting to me. And, uh, and, and then why managers did do it, I thought there'd be a similar list and there, there really wasn't. There was just one reason <laughs> why managers use recognition. And that is that, that to a person, they had internalized importance of that variable that they, uh, they had uh, decided that if I'm gonna be managing people, I'm in charge of the motivational background. And so not, not HR, not the CEO, not corporate, me, it's me and them. And so if, if I want them to be, uh, do a good job, if I want them to be excited about their job, it's up to me to set that environment and to, and to lead the charge with my own behavior and how I treat them. And, and that, um, that learning I've used uh, 20, for 20 years since in trying to get organizations to see that and to do that uh, with, with uh, a lot of mixed results. I, I, so in a nutshell, that's kind of um, where I came from. And, and so the best managers, they realize it's important. And because they realize that, they, they look for opportunities in their daily work life, when they're managing, uh, to to uh, for for success, and for people having done a good job, or for people having followed our core value, or for people which may be teamwork or excellence or going above and beyond, they they actively look for those indicators, and when they realize one, they they react to it, they act on it. They, they thank the person, great job with that. 
or to call them in their office just to thank them, not to lecture them, not to tell them, here's some more work to do, but to say, hey, you did a really good job in that meeting. I just want to point that out. I was very impressed. Or that presentation, or I can't believe how fast you solved that problem. You're very good at this. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and as a result, the employee uh, was more motivated <laughs> to do that type of thing. In fact, every time you recognize someone, not only are you making them feel good, you're sending them a message that, that this is important and everyone else that saw you do that or heard you did, did it will also get the message that that's what gets noticed around here. Finishing your project, your work on time, working well with others, being, being uh, creative and coming up with an answer. I can do those things and get out of their way because they, they will do more of them. And for the person, for the group, and for the organization, you'll get more of that type of success. There you go. Wow, that's that's really so true. It just needs a small recognition, right? Like everyone just wants one one appreciation that drives. Recognition is indeed a driver. Yes, exactly. And and now um, now that, so it's a it's a simple answer, but it has a complexity to it yeah. because. Yes. Um, it has to be, it has to be uh, timely. So the sooner someone does a good job, the sooner you acknowledge that, the shorter the distance between you saying, hey, great job, and they finished it, the greater you're reinforcing it, the more impact it has. If you wait, if you, if you forget it and you wait a couple weeks, it's not gonna have the same impact. If you wait a month and say, hey, you know that project you mentioned, you finished last month, that was a good job. What project? I don't remember. You know, that's a disconnect. That actually suggests that your manager is not aligned with you and your work very closely if they randomly mention it later, you know. So, so you, you, you got it. Timing is important. It's got to be um, sincere. It has to come from the heart. You can't be going through the motions. You can't be walking out in the office and, hey, everyone's doing a great job. Yeah, keep it up. That doesn't ring true. And chances are everyone's not doing a great job. A few people are doing a fantastic job, but and you got one person working for you, you probably should have fired a, a year ago. And everyone has to work around them and they can't figure out why you, you, you can't see that the person's not a performer, you know? And, um, and so you have to be uh, uh, sincere and uh, you gotta be on target. So the things that you acknowledge have gotta ring true for them. So that means, it does it's not the same for everybody so because we're each motivated differently and we're motivated differently over our career for any one of us so to really do this well you got to get to know people <laughs> you got to ask them and ideally from the first time, day you hired them and you you take them out for coffee or tea or lunch and you say hey there's a lot of places you could have worked in the mumbai <laughs> What was about working here that got you excited? Why did you apply here? And what do you hope to get out of this job? What do you hope to learn? Where do you want to be five years from now? Wow. I almost think, how can you, how can you manage someone where you don't know where they're trying to get to in their own life and career? Yeah, they're not just there to do your bidding. They're, they've got their own aspirations, their own goals. In fact, my definition of engagement is the, uh, is the alignment of personal aspirations of the employee with the, the company objectives. And the person to bring those into alignment is the manager uh, with each person. So uh, that's the, the fun and the joy of making it happen. It, for yeah. some people, it sounds like a lot of work. If they, don't, if they didn't want to do it to begin with and they don't really think it's that important, then why should I waste my time? Why, you know, people could do what they want on the weekend, you know, and I'm, we're here for work. We got to get this work done. It's like, well, okay, if, if you're going to be a slave driver, good luck with that. And, and uh, my guess is you're not going to get from them what you could have had you been encouraging, had you shown an interest in them and their family and their career and had you led the charge towards greater performance. That's so true. That keeps the employee even more belong towards the organization, right? Yes, to the manager and to the organization. It's so, only one out of every 
four or five managers that any of, of us will have in their career that will think they're a good manager. That was a great manager. One, one out of four or five. Choose to be one of those four or five and you will be a magnet for talent. People will want to work for you. And we all has a, have a manager like this. Think back in, in, in all the jobs you've had. Is there a manager that stands out that they were great to work for and they were, they, they, uh, were encouraging and they took time to explain stuff to you. And when you had a question, they, they, uh, they answer, if they didn't know the answer, they found out and got back to you. Wow, that's showing trust and respect. That's showing consideration. And they did it for the whole group and everyone loved that person and they worked harder for them as a result. And they worked, they didn't say, oh, look at the time, I got time to go home. Wow, too bad about, I didn't get this work done, but no, 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 they're good. Hey, I'm, I'm pretty close, I wanna finish this project. I wanna, in fact, I'm gonna work on it, uh, I'm gonna take it home this weekend, you know, uh, because I'm motivated. A person made that happen. Now, any of us have, have self-motivation and for any profession, professional, that's important. And that can, you know, that, that can go a ways, maybe a long ways, even if you've got a, a personal commitment and excitement about what you're doing. Um, but usually other people enter the, the picture. If you're, if you're really committed and you work really hard and no one ever says or does anything, you get the same raise as everybody else. And uh, I, I don't know any, anyone that doesn't say along the way, why am I hitting it so hard if it doesn't make a difference? And no one seems to care. My manager never says anything. It's like I'm, I'm personally, uh, this, this commitment, I, I work harder, means, and then it's hard work and it takes longer and then no one seems to care. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that anymore. And I, I, I've talked to employees that just like that, one, something happened, they stopped taking home work, just like that. You know, that uh, I remember one, one uh, friend that worked for city government and, and they had, um, uh, they were going to do some recognition of the project team and they had them, uh, they got a photo op of the project team with the mayor of the, the, the city, you know, big city and, uh, you know, a big group shot. And, I, and he, he said, I looked at the people in the photo and, and, uh, a third of them never came to a single meeting on the project, you know, and, and that person, all he did was complain, you know, and he, just like that, he stopped taking home work from that job. That's it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to burn the candle at both ends for this job. It's not worth it. So that's how, it, that's how it translates to the individual person. That's, that's deep. That's really uh, amazing. So that brings me down to, you know, employee retention and talent acquisition is something that still remains a challenge for even top organization, right? So what is your opinion on the best strategies that, you know, organizations could uh, involve to solve it? Sure. Well, the simple behavior I'm talking about, acknowledging people, thanking them, and others that relate to it, which ironically, delightfully, don't have any cost. So asking them their opinion, asking them for ideas and suggestions for how we can save money around here or improve processes or, or, or improve customer service, um, involving them in decisions, especially those decisions that affect them and their work and their job. Even if, if you say, I'm the, I'm the boss, I've got to make the final decision, but I realize it'll be a better decision if I have your input. You all are closer to the work and the job, so I want to I want to make sure I get that. Uh, so, so even if, even if you're making the final decision, it'll be a better decision, and you'll be showing consideration. Um, and and then if they're a part of it, it'll be easier to implement the decision. Okay. So a lot of a lot of uh, benefits. Um, Two way communication very important or mistakes. How you handle mistakes, very, very important. Bill Gates, founder and former chairman of Microsoft, uh, one of the most successful companies in the world, uh, once said, you can tell a lot about the long-term viability of any organization simply by looking at how you handle mistakes. Yeah. If you, if you, uh, or quick to jump all over the person. You did it wrong. We have a policy about that to 
embarrass them in front of their peers, to criticize them publicly, yeah, they, they won't make that mistake again. But what you get from them is going to get smaller because now they're going to spend more time making sure you don't see another mistake they make. They could be kind of watching out, protecting, doing emails to, to justify what they did. So if it goes bad, someone else gets blamed. They could spend more and more time doing that and less time actually getting real work done. This is what happens in organizations. Uh, and, and so if someone makes a mistake, instead of jumping all over it and saying, ah, oh, you did this wrong and, and proving you're the smartest person in the room and embarrassing them in front of their peers and, and that, bravo, bravo, they're getting their resume ready because they can't take working for you anymore. You're a micromanager, you're divisive and, and uh, it's terrible to work for you and they feel terrible and they, and they take that, all that uh, angst and anger home to their family. In America, at least, the average worker spends 15% of their time at home complaining about their boss, <laughs> which it, it then makes the, the family unit miserable. You know, you're miserable already. Now you're gonna make everyone else miserable. As you, and coworkers, you're gonna complain about your boss and this stupid company. Why doesn't upper management do something? You're gonna be a super complainer. Wow, you're gonna be a grouser and throw some politics in there and forget about the customer, forget about doing a good job. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, so instead of doing that, how, how hard would it be to, say, to, to take a breath and uh, someone makes this mistake, to take a breath and say, you know, I'm not sure if I would have done it, approach it the same way you did, but what did you learn from that? That could have been the best training we gave you all year. I'm glad you made that mistake because you're never going to make it again, are you? No, I'm not. Perfect. And, and take the long-term view of the relationship with that employee instead of the short-term view of you proving you're, you're smarter than them and, and uh, letting other employees know. Uh, so those type of things all, all kind of relate. None of them cost money. And this is part of the, the magic of this topic is, is the most powerful motivators have no financial cost at all. So to answer your question, as an organization attracting talent, how does this play out? What's well, an amplification of what I just described for the individual manager? If you can get uh, more managers to do that, more leaders in your organization, at some point you'll get to a critical mass and that will be part of the culture of the organization. This is how we do things around here. We're always taking time to thank people and acknowledge people and to, and to celebrate success in different ways. Uh, and that might be with food or, or allowing the person who completed the project to present it themselves to the management team and on and on and on. There's all sorts of ways. And as a result, um, if it becomes part of the culture, part of the culture of the organization, and by the way, I got my PhD from Peter Drucker, <laughs> the, the, the father of modern management, uh, he says, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So if you really want to have a high-performing operation, you got to get it into the culture. That's how we treat each other around here, not the plans of our strategic objectives. We're going to do this. And yeah, okay, well, that's good. But what's more important than that is the culture. How do we work together? How do we treat each other on a day-to-day -day basis? And it's a little harder to impact for that reason. But Case, case be, be known that if you actually do that and create a culture of recognition, where it's not just one manager, one leader doing it, or one executive, but it's everybody's doing it. Everyone sees the light and everyone operates in that way. And it's kind of becomes a consistency and, and uh, you learn from each other as you get better yourself. If you truly have a culture of recognition, research indicates that number one, your people, will feel five times more valued than if you didn't have that culture. They will be six times more likely to tell others and their family, their friends, about what a great place you're working for. <laughs> and, and wow, you're going you're gonna to get a reputation as an employer. Uh, they will be seven times, to get to your long-winded answer to your question about attracting talent, they will be seven times more likely to stay in the organization 
for their career. They have found home. This is a great place. They, they help me learn and grow. And when I have new skills, they give me opportunities to deploy those. They, they promote me. They pay me more. This is a great, uh, I'm so glad I've, I've got a career here. It's not just work, it's a career. And uh, I'm learning, I'm growing, I'm getting somewhere. I'm making a difference with my life. They will finally be in a culture of recognition 11 times more likely to be committed to the job, to the manager, to the mission of the organization. 11 times more committed than an organization where we're not doing the stuff I've been talking about. That's research from uh, Merits Inc., um, uh, a one and a half billion dollar incentive company based out of uh, St. Louis, uh, Missouri. Wow, that's, that's really nice. I mean, yes, like, Culture is the best strategy that you can adopt, right? Yes. It's, it's, it's harder to do the softer things in business, though. Yes. That kind of seems like frivolous and smoke and mirrors. It's harder to do those things than, you know, it's, it's relatively easier to do the hard aspects of business, you know, increasing the efficiency of our ordering process. Well, let's, you know, well, let's examine that and let's make those changes. Okay, we got it. It's easier to do those aspects. It's hard to do the people things uh, because you, you can't just uh, wave a wand and, and it happens. You have to talk about it. You have to train for it. You have to encourage people. You have to spotlight people that are good at it uh, to, so others will emulate them. It's a whole journey. It's a whole journey. It's a, it's a complete journey. And I completely agree with the point. It's not just work, it's a career. So like yeah. that is very deep. I mean. Yeah, it's not just you finish this job, you paid me this money. It's like, wow, well, that's one, one level of work and that has some success to it. And uh, you got to pay people if that's the contract. You know? But uh, the bigger impact is when you have, you take the whole person into, into account. And, and the fact that they have, again, their own ambitions and they want to, they want to be successful, and they're supporting a family, and and you take that all into consideration, and and so that it's not just, it's not just an assignment, you know. Here, 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 here you done with that? Here's some more work for you to do. Get get busy. That's one way to delegate. Another way to delegate is say, hey, Gary, you know, we got inventory coming up. I immediately thought of you. Because we've talked about where you want to get to in the organization, and you've made it very clear that you'd like to get into management, and I'd like to help you get into management. And so I've, I've been thinking about the key skill set to put you in line for a job like that. I can't promise you that job. I can't guarantee that job. But what I can do, as I, as I told you, is I can help you get in line for the promotion that you want. And so one of those skill sets uh, is, is inventory. And we had inventory come in, but I thought, well, this would be a great chance for you to pick up that skill set. Uh, now, you got, you got a lot on your plate already that I expect to be done. So if this is not a good time for you to take on a new assignment, a new responsibility, just say the word. And uh, I won't hold that against you. That's okay. Uh, but if you are willing to take it on, let me just say up front, there will be no such thing as a silly question. I will do whatever I can to make sure you understand this skill set to the best of my ability and knowledge and truth be known it's probably going to take me longer than if i just did this work myself which i've done many times before but i think there'll be some learning for you here yeah. so think it over let me know if you'd like to take on this assignment what does gary say yes i would thank you for thinking of me <laughs> i appreciate the opportunity i'm excited about doing it <laughs> of course you are <laughs> and so it goes you know, isn't that a world of difference to have the person be excited and, and go home and tell their, their spouse, guess, guess what opportunity I get to work on now? Yeah, I'm going to have a chance to meet executives in this part of the, the company and learn this skill set. That's fantastic. As opposed to say, oh, great, another, another project. Oh, like I've got nothing to do. Man, this job is killing me. It's killing me. I don't have enough time. <laughs> and then and we're on the on the, the blame game and the grouse wagon. <laughs> and this, this, my boss is a jerk, you know. He, why doesn't he do some of this himself, you know? And so it goes. Which path do you want to take? <laughs> the choice is yours. Yeah. 
So do you think leadership has a big role to play in it? Like can employee engagement can be, you know, uh, improvised by improving the leadership engagement? Of course, because we, we um, follow the leader. <laughs> yeah. we, we, we believe our actions speak louder than our words. If, if a, for example, if a leader, take any behavior, if a leader says, okay, you know, it's really important for us to make ethical decisions. That's one of our core values, ethical decisions. I expect everyone to make ethical decisions. Any questions? No? Okay, good. Uh, if, if we're saying that, and then and meanwhile, you're, as a leader, you're giving a, a company a bribe to get the low, you know, the, the work from them, and they all know you're doing that. Your credibility is, you know, in the toilet. <laughs> so like, and they say, uh, here's the thing around here. Do, you know, uh, it, it's not important. Uh, the managers do what I say, not what I do. Uh, well, what, that's, what type of culture is that? So, so and, and they're saying, well, forget about ethical behavior. Look who got promoted the last couple of times. It was a person that had the highest, the highest, uh, customer service numbers or, or the highest sales rate. That's who got promoted. Uh, or so the, do that and you'll get promoted. Forget about ethical behavior. And, and that, again, that's how it plays out in different ways. So, so the, um, the, the leader has got to be um, constantly showing the behavior that they want from their employees. And, and so if, if as an executive, if they think their managers when they do a good job or they finish a project and then they spend time talking with their managers about what can we do to celebrate this this is a fantastic job that the whole team did and i want to pay some attention to this that's going to be a, a world of difference and we're just piling on more work until you can't take it anymore so so the leader's role is very important and so when i work with corporations in trying to change the culture uh, we end up um you know remember i said that that for the number one reason for most leaders why they don't do it is they don't they don't really understand how to do it well so we take time uh to explain how to do it well i i'm working with one fortune 500 uh, high-tech company right now in, in fact they've got they've got a significant number of employees in india by the way but i'm not gonna say who they are <laughs> and and they um, but they're they they're very good at this and and, and we we spend time uh, I've spent time with upper management and I remember the the person my my uh, person that brought me into the company and their role in the company their head of employee engagement this is their job and they initially they initially took uh, this topic of recognition to the executive team they were almost laughed out of the room. What? Things you guys come up with in HR. We don't have time for that. You know, people are making snide, executives are making snide remarks at the person presenting. And they're, they're laughing and, and uh, you know, we got too much uh, serious work to do. Thank people for doing what, yeah, they can, if they're not happy, let them get a job somewhere else. We, we pay people well. We pay better than industry average. We give them stock. How many jobs can they say they can get that from? Good luck, and that and that that's a sincere reaction from typically from upper management. They, this is this is hooey. This is complete complete. Uh, uh, we're not going to do this this uh, this huggy stuff and and blue smoke and mirrors. We're here to work. If people don't want to work, let them find a job somewhere else. Any questions? And, 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 that, and that was kind of, uh, I exa exaggerated a little bit, but that was the reaction they got from executive, the executive team running the, this, this corporation. They brought me in to talk to the same group. No one laughed. <laughs> no one laughed. <laughs> Dr. Bob did his doctoral dissertation with Peter F. Drucker. He has worked with 80% of the Fortune 500. He has sold 5 million books because his stuff works. His research works. We've invited him in here and he's made time to join us at our request to share what we need to do. We've given him all we could about the data of our, of our company. In fact, one of the first things he said was, 
we need to do some focus groups because you, you just told me you know what your, motivates your people, but I don't believe it. And you say, oh, no, no, we know what they want. They want, they want money and they want promotions and they want, they go, really, is that what they want? Okay, well, let, let me talk to some of them. Oh, no, no, no. And at least this is what happened. It took me a year to get to the executive team. No, 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 no focus groups. We already know what they want. So it took a year to do a focus group there. And when I did and I asked people, what, what does it look like when you feel recognized, when you feel valued, when you're proud of where you work and the job you did? And you know what? Nobody said money. <laughs> Nobody. Uh, people said, I just wish someone would notice me. I, um, I work hard, I make my deadlines, I'll work through the weekend. I just wish somebody would, would care and say, great job. Uh, my manager never does that. No one ever does that. And, and, and I feel isolated and, and I, I, I have, I'm less excited about being here because my work I do doesn't seem to be valued by anyone. And, and so we actually did a f focus groups and, and we got some of that feedback, just like I said, uh, and, and we gave that to upper management. You know what they said? Do more focus groups. <laughs> and, and because what was going on, and this often happens, because the things that they say that they need, we don't think we need them, but if they say they need them, yeah, we can give them that. If that'll, if that'll help them work harder and stay longer with us, absolutely. But let's make sure you got it right. Do more focus groups. This, this same group a year earlier said, do not do any focus groups. We already have all the answers. <laughs> so, and so it goes. This is very common with all organizations. They think we, we, know, we know what motivates people. And it's what they, what they uh, want to believe. They haven't, they've never taken time to ask people. It's what they want to believe. Because money is the most important thing, right? Money. Everyone knows that money <laughs> and and uh, promotions and and uh, uh, stock. If you know, if we do A, B, C, then they'll do anything for us. Guess what? They will not. They will not do anything for you. They will stay <laughs> until they can't take working there anymore, and they'll go somewhere else and be paid more. <laughs> Hopefully, a company that better they can better align with the mission and purpose, where they're treated better for the work they do, and that's what happens. So if you want to. If you want to attract talent, be a culture that is welcoming of talent, that works with them to help them develop. And if you do that, um, you, you will get better talent and they'll stay longer with you. So this whole, this whole thing, again, we started with thanking people for doing a good job. <laughs> okay, So you start internally with the people you have now that impacts how they feel about their job. They do a better job. They stay longer. And then you do enough of that and your company gets a reputation for being an employer of choice. And now outside the organization, people uh, know what type of company it is to work for because they've talked to other people that are working there. And, uh, and then maybe change your interview process. You allow them to talk more broadly to other employees, their team workers. It's not just the boss hiring them. We want our processes, we have you do four or five interviews and, and we have you meet the whole team you'll be working with. And then we asked the team, what do you think of, what do you think of Sally? Do you think she'd be a good addition? Yeah, we, she'd be great. You got to hire her. And now Sally's going to be more welcomed by the team. It's not, you know, it takes a village to get performance. It's not, it's not just a solo activity or the boss commanding orders and catching people doing things wrong and chewing them out. No, that's, that's old school. That's old school. We're, we're in the 20th 21st century, it's a different, you got to have a different approach. You can't command performance from anyone today. You cannot command performance from someone. It's always going to be their choice, their choice, which means it happens up here, how hard they work, how creative, how, how long they stick with it, uh, how, how their, their drive to do excellent work is going to be their choice, not yours. But if you meet them at that choice and you treat them right and they're, they're colleagues, it's good being part of the team and, and you're encouraged. And then if you can contribute more, they give you a, a, a promotion or a better job or more, more experience because uh, you, you show that you're a leader here. <laughs> that's the place people want to work for. It's not, not just the place that pays you the most. That's, that's so true.
so uh, since with the pandemic all around and the, you know the workforce has majorly seen a shift to remote work so what are, what would be your take on what would be the best way to manage performance in such distributed workforce well everything i talked about and by the way the pandemic is not it's not just you know okay that's going to be over soon and we'll go back to normal this is it going forward the people are going to be working from home uh and and already in in the us twitter facebook have announced have announced you don't have to come back to the office and you know we we, we took time to make sure you had the equipment you needed at home and and this and that and we've worked it out so, so now we now we're, we're comfortable with using zoom and so it's working we don't have to come back to the office and for almost every employee it's like really that's great <laughs> you know, because i'm tired of spending 45 minutes commuting and having to pay for parking or taking public transport and i've got everything i need right here where i work so this is a great company so there's going to be increasingly uh this is going to be the new norm even even companies that are opening up uh which were in the middle of now in america um they the regulations are being placed on them by the government and and by the state is desk have to be six feet apart well all of a sudden we can only use half the office are we gonna are we gonna spend more money to buy more office space to have people spaced out as eh, let them work at home what the hell yeah, so so i think this is going to be a new reality because we, we we got over the hump the biggest challenge in the whole thing and i do a program on managing virtual workers the biggest challenge is for the manager the most managers are not comfortable with managing people that they can't see the the the, the they can't trust the fact that uh Unless, I'm, unless I see them here working, I can't trust that they're doing it. I think they're out shopping somewhere. <laughs> and so that's been the hurdle. It's been around the management, not the employee. And so with, with this, we've had more and more tools, such as Zoom that we're on right now and other, you know, Slack. And there's a, a whole array of tools. To, to, you can manage someone better than if you were sitting next to them through the tools that are available. You could see if you were, if you were suspicious, you could see how, you can see what they type and how often every time they move their mouse. And you could, you could see every time, uh, every time they download something, every time they print something. Yeah, how much do you want to know about, are they doing the work? You know, it's, it's uh, uh, the tools are there to do it. They don't have to be sitting next to you. You do not have to have eye contact with them. And if you do, get on get on a, a chat every 10 minutes if that's what you need to make sure or have an open line so you can they can bring up a question just as they're working and and those are and you can do that and people do do that and the tools are there so we're over the hump the challenge of people working uh, from from home and from a distance we are over the hump and so it's going to be an ongoing part of what work means and it's going to be it's going to lead to a, a a big savings for, for organizations in uh, the investment in office space. This could be uh, a savings for employees in commute time and commute, ex commute expenses. Uh, in, in the US in 2012, the US Patent Office, ahead of their time, said, if you work for us, we don't care where you're physically located. You can work anywhere. And people said, yeah, okay. And they were, they were, their offices in Virginia, which is a very expensive, and the people were paid, high, highly paid to account for where they're living. And they said, you could work anywhere. A lot of employees said, if we could work anywhere, let's move to a small town where we get more out of our paycheck and we could get a nicer home and our, our kids can grow up in a real neighborhood instead of downtown. And, and, uh, so, so employees loved it. Uh, they saved $5 million in reduced um, expenses for, for office space. And, they're, and here's the core, here's the key. How, how about the work? Well, the, the number of patents they've been able to process has gone up 
by allowing that flexibility. You don't have to be in the office to do the, the job of processing an application. You could be anywhere. And uh, it's been very, very successful for them. We're going to have more, more success like that going forward. Um, so get back to your question again. I'm being, I've been very verbose. I apologize. Get back to your question. Well, what's the, the uh, key in managing people virtually is all the stuff I, I talked about in terms of recognition and, and, that, and being, you know, getting to know people. You still got to do all that. Okay. And that's, that can be a little harder because you've got, you've got to take more effort to reach out to them. So you're not, you're not bumping into them in the hallway. You don't say, hey, let's grab some lunch. So those aren't options anymore. That means you've got to double down and, and make sure you got you got to think of the employees that work for you. And, and gee, I haven't talked to Tom for, for a week. Let me check in with Tom. Tom, how, how's it going? You know, I want to see, have any, How's the work going? Have any questions? Let's do a debrief on where you're at. Uh, things that sometimes that's called a one-on-one -on -one meeting. You you've got to you've got to reach out and connect with them. And and likewise, you want to tie them into the company. You know, and which which they don't you don't have the they're not walking around in the middle of the culture. So you have a it's it's harder to connect with the culture. Well, so we have to focus on that. How do, what does that look like? And it's harder to connect with other people. So. So you might implement, as this company, um, I mentioned the high-tech company that I'm working with, uh, something that, it's called skip level meetings, where, you, where an employee is allowed to meet with their manager's manager to talk about their career. Well, you've been working here for a few years and, and I hear great reports on the job you've done and, and uh, I'm I was interested in spending some time with you to get to know you and to see where you'd like your career to head. So I can be supportive of that uh, movement. Wow, who wouldn't like to have that conversation with their boss's <laughs> boss? <laughs> you know? and, and so you, you have to work hard at reaching out to people to do the cultural type things, to, to have them feel, uh, feel what it means to be part of the company. When you're all in the same building, that's a little easier to do. So that's gonna be the bigger challenge. We've already, we've already uh, mastered, I would suggest, the technical challenge of the efficiency. And already we knew we have a lot of research that says that people that are allowed to work at home are more productive. I, I can remember just doing um, my, my own uh, study, if you will, with the group I managed. I had 16 employees. This was probably, uh, well, this was 20, 25 years ago. And um, we, we were looking at uh, having people work at home. And so I had, you know, we didn't have a lot of tools we have today. I had everyone track their time, what they were working on, the time they spent, um, in, in the accountability, but also just to, to, to go over that, uh, I can have questions and we can, you know, I, I could say, wow, you spent a lot of time on this one thing. I, uh, tell me about that. And I'll say, well, yeah, it looks like it took that. I say, well, you know, maybe there's a way you can streamline that, you know, that, that, you know, and then you brainstorm how to be more efficient. But overwhelmingly, studies say that working at home, people can, uh, are at least twice as productive. Okay, yeah. there's no interruptions. There's no socializing small talk. You don't hear about the baby showers and, and somebody's birthday. You can, you can dig in deeper without distractions, which for a lot of types of work, that means you can get further and more entrenched in it, you know? Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a real plus. Now, not every job is like that, but a, a lot of them are. And so um, if you, if you uh, make the effort and connect with people, and make up for that, that, that difficulty in, in making the culture real to them, uh, but uh, make the effort, or, or even to do that in a, uh, online in a Zoom call with your group. And if, if you end up doing group meetings, um, you can still do a lot of the same things that you could do live. And, and, and say, like, like one of my favorite ones is, uh, hey, let's take before we get started here, I'd like to do a praise barrage. Well, what the heck is a praise barrage? Well, I want to just take five or 10 minutes and everyone that's on our call here, we got five people. I like to, as I mentioned someone's name, 
I like other people to say what you most value in working with that person. 100% positive. Let's start with, let's start, let's start with Tony. Everyone speaks up and okay, let's move on to Mary. I, wow, that's a powerful activity. <laughs> you're getting feedback from those you work with, even if you're not sitting next to them, about what they what they feel of the value you have and what you bring to the team. Or if, if they were, you know, if they were hired online, and that's what's happening now. My my spouse just just uh, starting a new job. She was hired virtually for a company that's all working virtually. Well, you got to invest in, in, in having the team get to know her early on. And she's talked to people, but you got to do some of that in the group call. And, and hey, what, tell us about yourself, Jennifer, and, and uh, your journey. We've, you know, we've passed around your resume, but uh, we'd like to hear it from your, your own words. And, and they can ask questions and they get to know the person. This, you, don't, you don't have to have a meal with someone to get to know someone. You can do it fine on Zoom. <laughs> and, and maybe someday we will connect. And, that's okay as well. So uh, you have to work harder to do all those same things to create that culture. It's gonna be, that, the culture is gonna be more of a challenge for having people work remotely. The pr productivity is already, is already gonna be there and a plus. And, and actually one of the, the downsides that has in the past been um, leveled at uh, virtual work. Uh, in fact, uh, I don't know, was it uh, oh, seven to eight years ago, uh, Yahoo, uh, their, their CEO um, had people stop working remotely, stop working from home. They said, we, we want you in the office. And her justification for doing that was that we need more collaboration. So you can be more productive working on your own at home, but collaboration comes from people working together, which means you got to be with people. So everyone had to come in the office and they made some exceptions, but a lot of people, and a lot of people that had been hired being told they can work at home now couldn't anymore. They had to come into the office and, and how long are they going to stay, you know? And, um, and then other, uh, Best Buy did the same thing that they said, no, we got to have people here so we can collaborate and we can brainstorm. And, and uh, you know, I think there's probably some truth to that, but um, you can do those same things virtually. It just might be a little more challenging or maybe harder the first time, but then you get comfortable with it and now it becomes easier. And so I, th I think that's the journey of, of where we're headed on, um, on working from home. Um, wow, <laughs> that's deep. Like it's, it's quite a journey. Like as you said, it is a journey. It's not, it cannot be just defined in a two or three line. It's, it's a complete journey that takes. It's like a future of work is here. It's not in the future anymore. And we need to adapt to it. Yes, the, the future of work is now. Yes. <laughs> and I work with companies that, that uh, they're, they are doing job of the work of the future, they're doing it now. And, and, and how they manage people, how they treat them, uh, how they innovate. Um, and it's exciting. And I, I, I love doing that. And I, I, I learn from them that, to help the next client I work with. And, and uh, or through things like this, on, on, on things I've seen that work. So I, I've done uh, 30 books, and so I spend a lot of time researching. I spend a lot of time looking for good examples and case studies. And I put those in my books, and then I use those in my my presentations, not unlike this, or at conferences when I keynote conferences. And it's uh, always trying to tell the same story, it has different angles to it, but it's the same type of story. Um, be be the be the company, be the manager that people want to work for, because they're learning, they're growing, they're excited to for for what they're doing and who they're doing it with. So Bob, uh, to sum this up, the interview, uh, like, do you have any last sound bites that you would love to leave our audience with? Longest journey starts with the first step, so you don't have to you don't have to do this all tomorrow. If you hey, here's the thing. Why don't you just start with listening? You know, I, I talk to a lot of managers that take a new job and they go, they go what, what, what advice do you have for someone starting a new job as a, as a, as a manager? I say, well, well, my advice is um, usually someone takes a new job, they've been promoted, and their tendency is they want to prove themselves. And so they can prove themselves by, by being the smartest person in the room to, to 
to be closely watch everything and to and to call people out when they made a mistake and to and to uh, correct them or maybe take it back and do it for them. <laughs> and the, the employee, try, why, why should I even try? Because you're going to take it back anyway. And so you, 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 by doing what you think is a good manager thing to do, to, to be all over everybody and micromanage them and, and uh, fix every problem for them, uh, they don't need to do anything anymore. You can do it all yourself and good luck with that. You're going to be a, a super worker. Bravo for you. I'm going to work somewhere else. <laughs> That's the tendency people have. So uh, my advice to a, a manager, a new manager, or to someone that this is foreign to is to say, um, just take a step in that direction. Try listening more than talking. So if you want to make a, a good impression, you're taking a new job and you could be managing 10 people, for example, Start with talking to each of them and asking them their opinion. What do you think most needs to be done to improve your, your work and that of our department? And just take, take a week, take a day at least, and, and talk to each of those people and, and, and take notes and, and, and understand what you're saying. And then based on what you heard, pick one or two things that you're gonna focus on. This is all stuff from the employees again. You're going to focus on to help your employees be more efficient and help the department be more successful. Be the manager instead of the micromanager, the manager that, that, that comes back and, and goes to bat for the thing that they heard the, the employees most need and goes to his boss and say, hey, you put me in this job. You got to support me. <laughs> you know? And I'm telling you, we need, we need that software upgrade. And you, 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 I've, I've heard that it's been years now that's not in the budget. If you want me to do the job you put me into, we need that. We need it now. Uh, okay, you can get it. And now, now your employees are going, oh my God, this person is a miracle worker. For years we haven't, you made it happen. She made it happen. This is a great leader. Uh, we're gonna make some stuff happen now. Be that person. And that, here, that's the first step. You listened, you listened more than said, okay, here's what we're going to do. I've got the, the right answers. You listen to what the answers were from your people. And that will start to take you in that journey to be the leader everyone wants to work for. Okay. I, I, uh, my, I have uh, a lot of my books are distributed in India. Uh, the one I'm probably most known for is, is called uh, A Thousand and Ways to Reward Employees, which I did is in the 64th printing. I did this 25 years ago. It's my, this is the basis of my doctoral work, and it's uh, it's sold over two million copies. So it uh, that doesn't happen by accident. That, that can only happen if what's inside this book actually works and can help any manager. So I, I would uh, challenge anyone that heard this to. Um, find a copy of that, or you, I, I would send it to you for my own company. I, my website is www.drbobnelson.com, D-R-B-O-B-N-E-L-S-O-N.com. And all my books are available at discounted prices, even cheaper than Amazon, uh, because the, my books are an extension of my beliefs. And so everything you heard me talk about i talk about this in the books with with a lot more examples and specifics and and suggestions so so again thank you for your time and for having me uh on on your show i i look forward to to um seeing uh having it help others and and getting feedback from them as to if people have uh have questions i i uh, give you my email address which is very similar bob at drbobnelson.com <laughs> and I, I take, uh, I answer questions from all over the world on a daily basis. So I'd be glad to hear from anyone that, that heard this. Sure, sure. Thank you so much, Bob. It was, an, it was an amazing experience with you and it's surely going to be the same for our audience as well. Well, I certainly hope it is. And thank you. Thank you so much again for having me.